Welcome everybody. My name is Mary Francis and I'm your worship associate today. Thank you. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce um, Marta Pearson, a member of our church and our guest speaker for our program today. Yeah, better now than not later. In 1955, James Baldwin traveled to Switzerland to live for a time in a small, remote village where he could write in peace. In his essay, Stranger in the Village, he de details his treatment by the villagers who had never seen a person of color before. While friendly, he was to them more a curiosity than a man. I quote, I reacted by trying to be pleasant, it being a great part of the American Negro's education long before he goes to school that he must make people like him." Closed quote. I light our chalice this morning in honor of Viola Luzzo, Reverend James Reeb, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwinner who were all martyred, martyred in the fight for civil rights. Singing to the choir is shorthand for those who need to hear the message the most aren't here. But even those who don't need it the most can learn something. When this message first pinged in my brain, it was a title. It's not a card, it's a whole deck. I knew it was the one I wanted to write and deliver. However, I put it off for quite some time. I wasn't sure I could come up with 52 cards. Sad to say, when I did begin my list, I had no problem finding 52 distinct issues, many directly related to my life, plus two important jokers. I'll recite them all for you, but only go into details about fewer than a dozen. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. That was then. And this is now. I want more than a dream. I want a reality check. It's not a card. It's a whole deck. How racism hurts us all. Clubs. The club's suit for me is history to present. The hurt and the harm. It is slavery, it is whips, it is Jim Crow, it is segregation, it is voting denied, it is poll tax, it is a voting test, education denied, the school to prison pipeline, which we face here in Hillsborough County now. The prisoner, the felon, the ex-con, who has no liberty even after they have served their time, who are not allowed to vote, who have little chance of finding housing in public housing, who have little chance of securing a job, all the things they need to remain out of prison. The unemployable, the last on the list to be hired, the disenfranchisement, and the hopelessness. Those are the clubs that I see wielded over and over again on the heads of people who deserve better. The spades. The spades are the names. They are the sticks and the stones and the bullets, they are the names that we have been called. 
They are the Jungle Bunny, Jigaboo, Nigger, Mulatto, Colored, Negro. As I was a child, colored and Negro were the terms that I was called. I can remember as a young adult, just in my early 20s, when black became the standard name for us. And I wore it proudly because for the first time in history, we chose what we would be called. For the first time in our history in the Americas, we got to choose. African American, it is the new term. And I now understand how my grandmother was so uncomfortable with black. <laughs> Cause we didn't choose it, the next generation did. I still call myself black because it is what my generation claimed. And I know that the next generation is using African American and I'm proud of them for choosing what they want to be called. So, for the first two times in history, we have claimed ourselves. We are no longer what others decide for us. We are what we decide for ourselves. Spades are also the martyrs and the plain folk, the people who fought and died for civil rights, the people who stood up and marched in Selma, the people who went to jail, the people who did sit-ins, the people who stood with us and not by to let things continue to happen that were wrong. They are the young men who will never grow old and the young women who will never become mothers. They are the good police officers who will never live to see their children and grandchildren grow. They are the ones who have been prejudiced against the stereotypes that lived. I remember when I was 17, about to graduate high school, our community, our neighborhood was being ra raised by uh, urban renewal. So we had to find a new home. The payouts were generous for all of the homeowners and so my mother and stepfather had the money to buy a home wherever they chose. My stepfather was from Oklahoma. He was part Native American and he looked white. He could have passed. He chose not to. He went to a small town called Munster, really wasn't even a town yet, it was a suburb out in the county. And he was looking for a home there. I don't know that he was really serious about moving to Munster, but he wanted to explore all his options. He was going along with a realtor, looking at houses. And one of the houses he looked at, the realtor said, you know, you don't have to worry about them moving in. Our volunteer police, uh, our volunteer fire department has already determined they'll never go if the house is on fire. My stepfather thanked him for the tour, went home, and ranted. I'm gonna buy a house, I'm gonna round up every wild, snotty-nosed, little colored kid I can find and move them in. <clears throat> uh, my mother uh, was the calming force and let him know that that was not really an option. <laughs> Munster is now integrated, as are most places. But that's a scar I wear from my childhood because I had been to Munster as a visitor in the, friends, in the home of friends. My friends would never have felt that way, but their neighbors certainly did. The last spade I have here is Martin Luther King Jr. 
a good one, one we celebrate tomorrow, and hopefully we celebrate each of the days that we do something significant and good for others. Moving on to hearts. The hearts are childhood and parenting and the pain that goes with both. I can remember in my 20s visiting my grandfather David. We would talk about my childhood, his son, my father's childhood. I remember one day as he talked to me about how I, as a three-year-old child, cried and he couldn't console me and he couldn't do anything about my tears and how impotent he felt that we could not go into an amusement park in Louisville, Kentucky. I don't remember that pain of a three-year-old, but I do remember the pain of my grandfather as he related that story years later. It is about a forbidden kiss. Busing occurred long before integration was an issue. In my hometown of Hammond, we outgrew our schools and the schools were crowded. And there was a town nearby that had extra space in their elementary schools. So an entire class, my class and another, were bused to the school with extra space. And so I would meet a lot of children that I never otherwise would have met. There was a little boy, and nah, I don't remember his name, and I'm not going to pretend I do, but I remember very clearly that he and I became friends. He was from another class. He was from that neighborhood, an all-white neighborhood, where I was from a very integrated, mixed neighborhood. And one day at recess, he attempted to kiss me. And I pulled back in great fear. This had to have been second grade. It couldn't have been more than that. And he said, why not? And I said, because you can't. I knew even then that it was forbidden. It could have been my first kiss, but it wasn't. When I first moved from Maine to Florida, and then from Florida to Washington State, I went through Canada because I had an old friend from high school who had moved there soon after uh, high school because he had met a woman from Canada and they migrated there. He's lived there ever since, Tim. Part of the time we talked and somehow the conversation got around to the fact that I'd had a crush on him when we were in high school. Not a big one, but you know, it was, it was there. He said he'd had a crush on me too. Nothing ever came of it though, because he was white and I wasn't. And we both knew at that time it couldn't have happened. Another heart. My daughter Nancy, 34 now, but when she was in second grade, she had a teacher who sent a note home to me within the first two weeks saying, it is likely that Nancy will need to repeat second grade. Now, it's not unusual for someone to form a judgment like that. It is unusual for them to put it in writing. She had looked at my daughter, who has a learning disability, and determined that because she was a poor little colored girl, she wasn't going to be able to keep up with everyone else. Now, I don't look for racism in everything that occurs in my life. And I just thought the teacher didn't understand about learning disabilities. But my best friend, who was a psychologist and wise and in ways that I wasn't said, Marta, that's not what she's looking at. She's looking at her race. And as it continued, I discovered that she was right. Now Nancy was smart, very smart. And the teacher had begun keeping her in from recess 
to sit by her desk and complete her work when she didn't get her work completed. Well, Nancy liked attention. What child doesn't? Well, some don't, but she did. So she was purposely not finishing her work <laughs> so that she could sit and get the teacher's undivided attention. I went in and I told the teacher, when Nancy doesn't complete her work, she is to bring it home to do with me. You are not to keep her in for recess. The teacher didn't listen to me. I mean, I'm just a black woman. I can't know what I'm talking about. She continued to do it. I went back and said, I will sit in this classroom. Oh, I talked to the principal first. That did no good. I said, I will sit in this classroom every day until you do what I ask. She did what I asked. My daughter in shopping. Now, every parent teaches their child how to go shopping, how to be nice and friendly and don't shoplift and so forth. But the kind of messages that we as African Americans, as blacks, as Negroes, have had to give our children is a whole different level than what you have to give to yours. I taught my daughter she was never to go into a store in jeans or any torn clothing or dirty clothing, that she was not to pick up things and look at them, she was to look at them lying flat, that she was to make sure that her purse always remained closed because they are the ones who would be targeted as a shoplifter, whether there was any truth in it or not. We all teach, or most teach, our sons and daughters to be polite to the police. But again, it's a whole different level for me. I taught my son that if you were ever stopped by a police officer, whether on the street or in your car, that you are to lower your eyes. You are to keep your hands in plain sight. You are to move slowly and you are to smile. No matter whether you are in the right or not, you are to smile, be still, be slow, and be respectful. Because as we have seen too often recently, without that, and even with that, bad things happen. I worked hard in junior high school. Actually, I worked hard throughout my school years. I was the original brown nose, and that's, I don't, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> in both ways, a brown nose, a suck up. You know, I was always having my hand raised. I was always up at the teacher's desk talking to the teacher. I would catch him in the hall. I mean, I would shine it. In junior high, at my, in my city, every year, every junior high school, the American Legion would give two awards to the two students, one male, one female, that teachers had selected as students of excellence. And I knew from the time I went into that junior high, it was gonna be me. I wanted it so badly. It was awarded based on scholarship, based on conduct, based on service. I wanted it badly. I remember when my teacher came to me and said, Marta, you are going to get the American Legion Award. That was unusual because it wasn't usually announced until the night of the awards. So I knew there was another shoe to drop. She told me the name of the boy who was also getting the award. And then she told me the name of the white girl who would be getting the award too. A friend of mine. She said that the American Legion would not allow the teachers to award a black, wasn't black then, colored girl the American Legion award without also rewarding one to a white girl. The teachers would not remove my name 
which is what the American Legion had wanted. And so they compromised. That was when I was 13. It still hurts. It still hurts that everything I could do was for nothing. Yeah, I got the award, but it was tainted. It wasn't real. Hearts are also jobs and promotions that are denied. Higher insurance. My insurance was higher because I lived in a black neighborhood than if I had lived in a white neighborhood. Loans denied. I worked for the post office. That's good money. But I couldn't get a loan to buy a house. My daughter's adoption. I had been a foster parent for the state of Kentucky for almost 10 years. I had an excellent record with them. I had adopted one of my foster children, a son, but I still wanted a daughter, and so I applied when I moved from Lexington to Louisville. I was assigned a case manager, and she assigned one of her social workers. In four years, Nothing happened. They kept asking me for more and more things. They kept putting off a decision. They kept criticizing things. And I just thought, it's me. Because social workers, as you know, come and go. So it wasn't like I had one person all the time. I had one, then I had another, and I had another. And I kept hearing the same things from each of them. So it had to be about me. Until a friend of mine in the department said, it's not about you, Marta, it's about the team leader. She only hires people who shares her view. She also told me that the regulation said that if a potential adoptive parent isn't approved within I don't know whether it was six months or a year, but there was a specified time that the department had to work with them to correct the issues. They had never done that. She advised me to file a complaint, so I did. When I filed the complaint, <coughs> the team leader asked me to withdraw my application, and I refused, so the complaint went forward. She then listed the reasons why I had not been approved. It went before uh, three social workers and they upheld her decision. It then went to the commissioner, the secretary of, of the department, who appointed a panel to look into the matter. The reasons that she had given include, there were seven altogether. Uh, one of them was that I was obsessed with having a daughter, whereas if on, on the application, if you couldn't specify daughter or son, why was it an issue that I wanted a daughter when I already had two sons? I mean, if I would said I wanted another son, she just said I was obsessed about boys. You know, made no sense. Um, she said I was omnipotent, uh, omnipotent, that I've had feelings of omnipotence. Well. That came because when I was asked, how do I, make, how do I deal with mistakes, I said, well, I have very few mistakes at that time in my life. I <laughs> don't know if I can say the same thing now, but at that time in my life, I mean, I had, I had bought a house, I, I had adopted children, I had raised a son as a single parent, I had a bachelor's degree, I had a master's degree, um, I, I had a professional job. Um, but I knew that as a single black woman, I couldn't afford mistakes like a lot of people. So whenever I looked at doing something, I always weighed the options of women, winning. And if they were less than 80% in my factor, I didn't even attempt it, which meant I was pretty good at winning. <laughs> but she labeled that feelings of omnipotence, godlike. We'll go into that another day. <laughs> um, she also said that I didn't cooperate with them. Well, there was a time when my son was having some problems and I got him therapy. 
and she wanted his therapeutic records. I said, he's not going to be the parent. I am. You can have all my records. I'm not allowing you to have my son's records. And that was refusing to cooperate with the department. Well, the panel had three options. They could uphold her decision to uh, deny my application to adopt. They could approve it with no comment, or they could approve my adoption with comment. They approved it with comment. Oh, I forgot to tell you, when I filed my complaint, I went to the paper because it would be too easy for it to be swept under the rug otherwise. <laughs> the paper followed up afterwards. The panel said that she had been totally inappropriate, that I was the ideal uh, parent to adopt. And within six months, I had my daughter because your name on the list was based on the time that you filled out your application. So I went to the top of the list, I got my daughter, and she is my pride and my joy. And many people uh, forget that, she, I mean, she has the same learning disability I have, she sounds like me, she looks like me, sometimes she acts like me, that's scary. <laughs> there is no blending. I hear people talk about how other ethnic groups were able to succeed, to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. There is no blending for us. Our skin is different. Our noses are wider. I spent hours, days, if you add it all up, trying to press my nose to make it more narrow. Didn't y'all? Yeah, I gave it up. It doesn't work. Um, our hair is different. It was made for the African veldt to hold in moisture. It is kinky. It is hard to control. I always thought that the god or goddess really had a bad day when they created us. They gave us everything wrong. Bad hair, bad nose, um, skin color, you know, and, and as a teenager, it always struck me as odd that all my white friends were trying to get my skin color, but they didn't like our skin color. It just, you know. There's so many paradoxes out there, aren't there? Well, those are those three decks. But diamonds, diamonds in the rough and sometimes shiny. My biracial great-grandchild, I have one of those, and my, bi and my black great-grandchild. My black and white grandchild, my Native American black Russian grandchild, now how's that for a mix? <laughs> Yeah, I have three white grandchildren from my stepdaughter. I have 10 black grandchildren. So I'm, you know, I'm just the whole United Nations there with my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But then you add in my white daughter-in-law and my white son-in-law, my Italian-Ukrainian best friend, my accepting church. And then we go to heart transplants for the minister, our intern, uh, uh, interim minister who I dearly love and respect, and who is partially alive because of Dr. Charles R. Drew, who did the work on blood typing and allowed all of those other medical miracles to happen. Dr. Drew was a black man. And to former President Clinton, because he's one of my diamonds, and for President Barack Obama. Those are the diamonds in my life. They shine. Some of them are rough, but they shine. I do have to talk about two jokers. Voter apathy. It is without question, one of the biggest problems I see. 
that African Americans and other minorities do not vote, that they think their vote doesn't count, that it will be wiped out by somebody else's counter vote. It doesn't matter if it is or not, vote. And we have a responsibility, all of us, to get everybody out to vote. I have not missed a local, a state, a national election since I was 18 years old. It doesn't matter how unimportant the election is, I vote because people died to give me that right. I want to start a campaign where we have a 100% vote get out in a neighborhood, in, in a, a street, in our church and that we come back together and we advertise that and challenge others to do the same thing. We need to vote. That's one of the jokers in the deck. And the other joker is a failure to educate. And while I vote, I have not, I have not lived up to this joker. I have not talk to my children enough about the past, about the things that happened that allow us to be where we are today. I have not talked to my children about the pain that I experienced as a childhood. I have not talked to them about the martyrs who died in Selma or in other towns in the South. I have not educated them enough, and I'm going to start. A few weeks ago, I sat in the teacher's lounge at a school where I was substitute teaching for the day. At a near table, people talked about the burning and the riots that occurred the previous night in Missouri. A white male in his late 40s told of his experience in high school when students wanted the clothing rules to change. They petitioned the principal who said no. They went to the superintendent who said no. They went to the school board who said no. The entire school body sat in the front of the school refusing to return to class. They ultimately got the change they wanted. I sat at my lunch and I tried to convince myself that it would be useless to say anything. <laughs> you all know I don't keep my mouth shut, but I was trying. Then I decided it was my responsibility to provide a teaching moment. I asked what they would have done if they hadn't been granted the choice they sought, the change they sought. That time after time, they were turned down. I could tell by the look on his face that he had trouble imagining that ever happening. I asked them to just consider that blacks have asked and asked and asked asked to no avail, and the frustration it leads to causes some to riot and burn. Not right, yet understandable. I told them about my American Legion experience, as I told you earlier, and I think some of them at that table got it. Martin Luther King Day is tomorrow. I urge each of you to find and use teachable moments. It's not about whether they all agree or get it. It's about us taking the opportunity to try. If we are successful one out of five times or one out of 10, it's better than zero out of zero because we didn't even try. Dreams only become reality through action. It's past time to dream. It is long past time to act. Yet it is never too late. The time is now. It is today, tomorrow, and every day, each of us has the reality that we deserve. Find those teachable moments Use them, embrace them, be the Martin Luther King Jr. and the Anne Frank of our time. Don't wait a single moment before starting to improve our world.
Thank you. Since high school, I have been impressed by the words of a teenager written before I was born and used them often when I close my messages. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Anne Frank. I was born in a world better than hers because of the actions of many. My children and grandchildren live in a world better than the one I was born into and grew up in. As we work together, may it be better still for all of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. The need continues. Dreams are nothing without the work that makes them reality. Go now and continue the work.